Hello, YouTube family. Hello, Facebook family. This is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III bringing you the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, March 29th. The title of the lesson is called The Need for Just Leaders. The Need for Just Leaders. It comes out of Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Then we move over to chapter 3, verse 5 through 7a. Before we get started, I need your help with something. I would like this broadcast to reach as many people as possible, and I need your help. If you can hit the like button, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, or the share button, that would be fantastic. If you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. I appreciate that very much. So let's get into our lesson for today. It's a very powerful lesson, a lesson that we can learn about. Uh, but first, let's talk about Malachi, who Malachi is. We don't know a lot about Malachi. We don't know where he's from. We don't know anything about his parents. We don't know anything about his lineage. But we do know that his name means my messenger or the messenger of God. We know that he's a minor prophet preaching to the in the post-exilic period, the period after the uh, when the Jews returned home from being in uh, captivity for 70 years. Uh, we do know that uh, uh, his predecessor was uh, Zechariah and Haggai. They were before him. And his contemporaries are Ezra and Nehemiah. So he's going to uh, bring his message about 80 years or so after Haggai. And uh, I want to give you a history that leads up into that that I think you'll find helpful that will be beneficial to our city. So what we have is uh, the northern kingdom being conquered totally by the Assyrian nation. The Assyrian nation, as it was their custom, took the uh, Jews out of the northern kingdom, brought them into their territory, and the people intermingled. And they came back, and that were therefore you have the Samaritans. About 150 years later, uh, the Southern Kingdom did not learn from the mistakes of the Northern Kingdom. Uh, they lived a life of oppression, the rich oppressing the poor. Uh, they had false worship, it wasn't in their heart. Uh, they uh, had an evil king after evil king, then they had one good king, then they had all kind of evil kings. They ignored the God's word. They ignored the prophets that God sent. Uh, they dabbled in idolatry. They were just doing all kinds of things. Everything that God did not want them to do, they did. And so about 150 years later, probably uh, there's a nation that came up, uh, the Babylonians. The Babylonians had already conquered the Assyrians. And so the Babylonians uh, conquered. God allows them to conquer uh, the southern kingdom Judah. That was approximately in 608 BC. That was the first deportation. The Babylonians had a philosophy of not leaving people where they are, but bringing them back to their country so they could be used as slaves or even assimilate. And that's what happened. So the first deportation happened in 608 BC. It was followed by a second deportation, the final deportation, that actually destroyed the, the temple of Solomon, and that was in 586 uh, BC. So for the next 70 years, uh, the southern kingdom, those Jews now called Israel, are kept in captivity. Uh, they are being oppressed. God uh, had prophet in Jeremiah that they would be there 70 years. So God brings up another power that becomes a world power, world power. that was the Persian nation. The Persian nation takes down uh, the ba great Babylonian nation, and the Cyrus, King Cyrus the first, is the ruler, uh, and so he signs a decree in 538 uh, BC that allows the people of Israel to return back to their homeland. During that uh, uh, exile, back going back to their homeland. Some of the people of Israel stayed in the territory they were at. They had adjusted. They did not want to go back. They maybe had been born there. Don't, they don't know anything about what Jerusalem was like, or they heard how it had been destroyed or completely tore up. 
from the Babylonian, Babylonian conquering them because when they tore down Solomon's temple, no stone was untold, unturned. It was burned. Uh, it was no nothing can grow there. It was just tore up. And someone probably did not want to return home. But scholars said there was about a remnant in between 50 to 150,000 people, uh, Jews that did return home. When they returned home, they came home to nothing. Uh, the first thing they attempted to build was a uh, temple. They laid down the foundation. That, that foundation set for a great period of time. Haggai comes on the scene. Uh, Zechariah comes on the scene. Uh, and they're able to build this temple in about two years. The temple was built in 515 uh, B.C., and so what we have there is that from 515 BC, it seems like the people of Israel are going to uh, be the type of people that God wants them to be because it took a tremendous effort to build that. But for the next 70 or 80 years, they do a spiritual decline. They go back to where they were. They worship false gods. The rich that were there, if there were some, took advantage of the uh, poor, didn't pay the wages. They ignored the widow. The, off, the orphan and the stranger, uh, they uh, beat them up in court. They just, uh, it was just terrible how they regressed. And the reason why they may have regressed, uh, one of the things was because when they came back from the uh, from Babylon, returning under Persia, it was poor. And so even though they built a temple and they were living 70 years later, it still was a poor nation. You have to remember that uh, Anything that they made or anything they had a value, Persia was extracting that from them by way of a tribute. Even though they did not uh, um, have them come back or stay in that territory in, in former uh, Babylonia or even Persia, they uh, their philosophy was to return them home, allow them to be productive and extract all the money from them and all the value that they had in that nation. So they were being extracted or that, that tribute was taken a toll on them and it was keeping them in poverty and you add poverty you add oppression you add illegal activity you add people taking advantage of one another it was a terrible thing and the reason why they were doing that probably was because they said god where's your justice you're allowing these people to treat us this kind of way take everything that we make we that we have to live in poverty we're fighting amongst each other things are not going right why should I put my trust in you? Where's your justice? Why should I put my trust in you? Why should I be faithful to you? Why should I worship you when it seems that you're not even there? You're not even around. And I'm going through all this turmoil. And sometimes when adversity comes, you can do two things. You can be drawn closer to God. Your faith can grow. Or you can be drawn away from God and your faith goes away and it becomes almost non-existent. And that's what happened there. They chose the latter. Their faith went away. Their trust in God went away. Their relationship diminished. Uh, even though God had brought them out of captivity, it had diminished. And they said, what the heck? I might as well live the way I want to live. I will live as if there's no God because God is not doing anything for me. And I just want to say that sometimes when we go through our adversity, we can think the same thing. But when we do that, we believe a lie. And we believe there are dire consequences. There are many of us today have been affected by the, the shutdown because of the coronavirus and number 19. Many have 10%, millions, 3 million people at least, and growing, and more will lose their jobs uh, because of the shutdown and because of the effects of the virus. And they're going to wonder, where is God? God, I have a uh, mortgage to pay. I have rent to pay. I have children to feed. I need food on the table. I have a water bill. I have an electric bill. I have a gas bill. God, um, I, I, I was planning so many wonderful things. I was supposed to be a child of yours, but it seems as though you've abandoned me. This came on me so fast. I don't know what to do. And Lord, it seems like I'm going to lose everything. I don't have any retirement. Wherever I had went away. I can't borrow from it because I have it, that. The market, market is down. That's gone away. Lord, what, I, what I'm going to do? I can't even go out and get a job because there, there's not any other job. Too much competition. And so sometimes in those dire needs, the way we're living now, we can lose hope. And what uh, Malachi is going to say is do not live, lose hope because there's a God that loves you. He may not act when you want to, but he's never late 
He's right on time and he understands what you're going through. Do not do what these people in this book did by turning their backs on God and living as if there is not a God. And that's what they did. And so Malachi is coming on the scene about uh, about 100 years after they have uh, come out of exile in Babylon, Babylonia. And he's, God has brought them because God is not happy about what he sees. He is very upset about the leaders and he's mostly, and he's upset about the people because as the leaders go, the people will go. If the leaders are righteous, the people will be on target. If the leaders are unrighteous, then the people will be unrighteous. If the leaders are living the way they're supposed to do. That will be a model for the other people, the rest of the people that live the, the way they should live. But this is not the case. God is disappointed in the leadership, and therefore he's disappointed in the people as a whole. And that's what's going on right here. It's a terrible time in the time of Israel. So let's look at, I'm going to go through chapter one real quick. That will set us up for chapter two into our lesson. Uh, God says, I have loved you, uh, says the Lord. He tells that to Judah. And what he, what he means is that I love you right now. And what he's saying is that I have never stopped loving you. That's what that really means. Uh, you may think I have, but I've never stopped loving you. And the people's response is a, a, a wordplay. It's a rhetorical wordplay. And he says, have, how have you loved us? The people have responded and said, how have you loved us? They're questioning God's love because of the circumstances they're in. Many people are questioning God's love because of the circumstances that they're in to no fault of their own. And they're wondering, God, you say you love me, but how have you loved me? I don't see it. I'm having difficult times. And God says to Israel, is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob. He said, I have never stopped loving you. I have never stopped loving Jacob. I have never stopped loving Israel. But Esau I hated. Esau I love less. Esau I have rejected. But I have loved you. And he asked them to look at the path of Jacob, look at his people, and look at the path of Esau, his people, the Edomites. He says, right now, the Edomites, your enemy that has been pestering you and pestering you, the Edomites, look at their situation right now. Right now, if you were to look where they are now, you will see that they're, they uh, let their, the land is, is waste. They're no longer there. Their land is now desert. It's unpro unproductive. And they don't even have a heritage. There's no more Edomites around. He says here, they left his heritage to jackals of the desert, scattered everywhere like scavengers, no community of people, uh, no legacy left behind. He said, this is how it happened. And I was in control. If the Edomites prospered, I brought up somebody to defeat them and scatter them. If they regrouped again and they they prospered again. I took them down again. I kept taking them down again until finally they were scattered for good and they had nothing. But look at you. I loved you and you are still here. He says, you saw what I did to them and you see where you are. That ought to signal to you that I love you and I rejected them because there's no real difference between the two but I've chosen to love you. He says, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. Meaning my, my love for you goes beyond this territory of Israel to conquering your enemies and protecting you from your enemies and defeating them for you. But this is what he says that he's upset with. He starts with the priest here. He said, a son honors his father and his servant his master. He says, if I'm the father, where's my honor? He says, I deserve honor, but you're not giving me any honor. I deserve respect, but there's no respect. Uh, I deserve to be praised, but there's no praise. I deserve to be held in a high stature, but you're not. You're not treating me as your father. You're not treating me with honor. He said, if I'm a master, where's my fear? 
says the Lord of hosts. Meaning that if I'm your master, if you're a father and your master, then there ought to be a certain amount of fear there, fear of the Lord. But you live a lifestyle that, that shows me that you don't even fear me. You live a lifestyle that shows that you don't even honor me. You, you do what you want to do as if I'm not even around. You live the way you live as if I'm not even your father. And God says, I'm upset with that. That is not right. He says, oh, priests who despise my name. You actually despise my name. When you hear my name, you, you frown. When you hear my name, you turn the other way. When you hear my name, you just do what you want to do as if I'm not there. And then rhetorically, you're going to say, well, how about despise your name? I don't do anything bad to you. I don't despise your name. He says, you despise my name by offering polluted food upon the altar. Polluted food upon the altar is defiled. Uh, it's a defiled sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that is sickly, that is ill, that is weak, that nobody will want. You give me the spoiled food. You give me the rotten food. Food. You give me the things that no one else, and you put it upon my altar. But you say, how have you polluted, how have we polluted you? By saying the Lord's table may be despised. You mean you tell the people that it's okay to give anything you want. You don't stop the people from giving bad sacrifices. You lead them in a way, in a way that disrespects them. He says, when you offer blind animals in a sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those who are lame and sick, is that not evil? You are doing evil and you're teaching the people to do evil when they offer a sacrifice. And the thing about it is that the governor of Persia, the one who comes and gets that tribute to you once a month, you don't give him what you give me. You give him the very best so he won't bring harm to you, but you give me the very worst and the things that you gave, you gave him what you gave me, he would not take it. God is upset. Look what he says here. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hand. He says, he says, you profane my offering when you say that the Lord's table is polluted. It's fruit, that is, it's fruit may be despised, but you say, what what a weariness this is, weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or, lay, or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. You give me the worst thing, things that you got from somebody else, the things that you beat up and took somebody else. There's, there's no personal sacrifice. There's no honor in what you do. There's no sense of fear in the sacrifice as you bring that uh, offering. He says, shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Curse that person who has a male in his flock, who vows to give to me, and yet sacrifice to the Lord what is blemished. You give me the bad thing, therefore you are cursed for doing that. You see, what we have to understand, what God is saying here, we have to understand who God is and who we are. God says, I'm a great king. I'm the Lord of hosts. And my name will be feared among all nations. Not only will you fear, but my, all nations will. I have to make that happen. And we understand that what we give God says a lot about us. What we give God says what's in our heart. And that's what we have to understand. God doesn't need the material things. He, what, it, what it does, it says what we think about him. He already knows, but it's, it's confirmation, verification of how we feel about God. If we give God our very best, that means God is way up there. He's worthy of our praise. If we've got the very least, God, I don't care about you. You're not worthy of my time. I'll just give you a little bit because just enough to get by, just so somebody can see that I'm giving you something and they can think I'm a certain way. What we give God, the quality of our gift, says a lot of how we feel about God. So the point number one here, God is not happy with the worship practices of the people. He's not happy with the priest. They are allowing this to go on. They are partakers in it. They are allowing the people to bring worthless sacrifices to God. And he's upset. So let's look at chapter two. We're now in it. Now he's going to uh, rebuke the priest. 
He gets on them for their polluted offerings because they're responsible for that. They have a key position. They are a mediator between the people and God, and they are supposed to be teaching the people what to do. So now he's going to rebuke them. He says, oh, now, oh, priest, this command is for you. This command right here, he said, I'm speaking just for you. This is a command for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart, if you will not listen to me, if you will not take it to heart, you will not uh, have it come become a part of you to give honor to my name, says the Lord, then I will send a curse upon you. He's telling them what, I, what he wants. He said, what does God want from me? The priest said, what does God want? You may say, what God wants you to honor his name, to respect who he is, to fear his name. To fear his name means to walk righteously, to be obedient. To fear his name, to honor him as a father and master means to have a relationship with him. That, well, that's, me, that's what it means. That's what God wants from the priest. That's what he wants the priest to teach his people. That's what he wants his community to have. And he says that, but if you don't do this, if you don't honor my name, if you don't listen to me, if you don't take it to heart, if your attitude does not change, then I will send a curse upon you, a judgment. That's what curse means. And I will curse your blessings indeed. You see, as a priest, you have, uh, it's a blessing, it's a blessed thing to be a priest. It's a blessed thing to be a pastor, to be a preacher, to be a teacher, to be a servant to be a child of God. As a priest, as a pastor, as a preacher, you had status, you had position. You, you could approach God on behalf of the people. Uh, God, you commune with God, you talk with God. You were a mediator between the, the people. Uh, people came to you uh, when they needed godly advice. You taught people. It was a position of respect. You were representing God himself. You are a messenger of his. To be a priest is a, 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 a blessing because of the spiritual nature of it. And what he says, I'm going to curse these blessings. You like being a priest? You like people coming to you? You like the attention that you get? Uh, you like being able to walk in the temple and, and give a sacrifice? You like all these privileges I've given you? Guess what? I'm now going to curse them. They're going to be under judgment. I'm going to take them away. He says, I've already, I've, I have already cursed them, meaning that it has already come into play that I'm cursing your blessings. It's already come to pass. It's a done deal. It's not going away. I know I have to do it, and it's already done. It's in the working. Now, do this because you do not lay it to heart, meaning that because your heart is not right, your attitude is not right, you do not honor me, you do not fear me. That's why these curses are coming. And sometimes we get a look in our lives sometimes and we see bad things happen to us. Sometimes bad things happen because we live in this world. The, the sun, the rain rains on the sun and the, on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. Things happen to the just and the unjust. But sometimes things happen because of our, our relationship or our lack of relationship with God. And that's what's happening here because we don't fear God, we don't honor God, and sometimes that brings curses into our lives. Sometimes bad things happen to us because we are not in right relationship with God, and this is what's happening here. He says, behold, I will rebuke your offspring, meaning that uh, in the priesthood, there were, you, you are a priest, then oftentimes your child will be, your son will become a priest, his son will become a priest, your offspring will keep the the lineage going, it will keep that priestly heritage going. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that off. And that's devastating to a priest because he wanted his that legacy to continue. And God says, you don't deserve it. I'm cursing you. I'm going to cut that off. It will be no more priest coming from you, coming from your, there will be no legacy. There will be no heritage. There will be no lineage. I'm cutting it off. Then it says, and I will and spread dung on your faces and dung on your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. A lot of times when the animal that was being sacrificed came into the temple 
It was on the altar to be sacrificed. Oftentimes, the animal would, would deposit dung on the temple floor. He would use the restroom inside the temple in it that, that unclean dung would be in a clean temple, the, the Holy of Holies, the place of the Lord. And that could not be tolerated. So that dung had to be scooped up and to be taken to a dung hill far away from the, the temple, far away and put into a dung hill and set on fire and burned up, never to have contact with that temple again, never to, uh, to be seen evermore. So what he's saying here, the same thing you would do to that dung, I'm going to do to you. I'm going to put it on your face. That will make you unclean. That will disqualify you able to be able to serve in the temple and represent the people and be my messenger. That will disqualify you. The offerings that you bring, I will put dung on them so you will not be able to bring these worthless, uh, weak, blemished, offerings to me anymore you will be driven out of the temple just like dung take it to a dung hill far away from the temple never to be seen again and you will be set on fire you will lose your position and your status as a priest inside the, the temple and in the community that will be stripped away from you then he says so so shall you know that i've sent this command to you my covenant with Levi may stand. He had a covenant with a person named Levi or a group of people uh, called the Levites. Here he picks out one person. He made a covenant, a covenant, and it's a conditional covenant. If the Levites will live a certain way, obey God's commandments, then, then they will be blessed with peace and life. So it was a covenant of peace and life. He says, my covenant with him was one of life and peace and I gave them to him. He said, it was a, now, God said, I will give you peace in life, but this is what you have to do. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. You had to be in awe of God. You had to fear God. You had to reverence God. You had to live and know that God is truly there. Uh, you had to be in partnership with him, in relationship with him. He said, he stood in awe of my name. This Levi named Levi, stood in the awe of my name. And God didn't have a big evil, but God is worthy of his awness. He is worthy of his fear. He's the Lord of hosts. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He's the one that sustains life. He can take us away in a moment, in a blink of an eye. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He deserves all respect, all fear, all awness. He's worthy of our praise. He doesn't have this big evil. He's just that God that deserves it. He says, it was, a, it was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in all my name. He says, this guy is Levi. This covenant with Levi. True instruction was in his mouth. He preached and instructed the word of God. He helped people. He taught the people. There was no wrong found on his lips. He spoke the truth. He studied it. He was, he was connected with God. The Holy Spirit was with them as he taught. God uh, was with them as he taught. He walked with me in peace, in harmony, in upright, meaning he was obedient. He was, had a harmonious relationship with God. They were connected. They communed together. His prayer life was good. His devotion life was good. He read the scriptures. His understanding of the scriptures was good. And he turned many away from iniquity. Many people came to know the Lord, sinners, because of him. He did what God asked him to do. He was the model priest, the model Levite. He was a standard in which priests and Levites should follow. Just for the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people meaning that the lips should make sure they're speaking the truth, making sure the truth is getting to the people. They should seek instruction from his mouth that people should come to him and want to hear a word from the God. Come to him for instruction. Come to him for counseling. 
Come to him when they have a question of how to live their life or what the Bible may say. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. The priest is the messenger. He's the communicator from God that communicates to the people. He is the mediator between God and the people, uh, between God, the Lord of hosts. That means the Lord God Almighty. He says, but look, this conjunction is called but in the ESV. Conjunction means that whatever I said before, I'm a contradicted right now. So what he's saying here is this word but is that this is the way it should be, but your lifestyle is contradicting what I had in plan for you. You are contrary to what a good priest is, but you have turned aside from the way. This standard that I expect of you, you don't do. You have caused, instead of helping people, you have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have, you have caused people to be led astray. James 3 says, there are consequences when teachers lead people away. Do not all aspire to be a teacher because the, if you lead them astray, there are some dire consequences. Since you have corrupted the covenant of Levi, it's no longer one of life and peace. It's no longer one of walking in harmony with God. It's no longer one of being obedient to God, says the Lord of hosts, says the Lord God Almighty. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people. See, people are supposed to love their pastor, love their preacher, love their priest. They're supposed to hold them in high honor, high regard. Uh, they're supposed to have a certain status or position in the community, but I'm going to take all that away. I'm going to strip you down to your knees. And instead of people loving you and liking you, they're going to hate you and despise you and not want to come to you and not want to be around you. When they hear the word priest, it's going to cause a frown on their name. When they hear the word priest, they're going to want no part of you. It says, in so much as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality as you you're guilty of showing partiality in your instruction. You give, you speak it to this one, but don't you reject that one. You you like this person, but you don't like this one. That's not the way priest operates. So God is upset. He's upset with worship as a whole. The sacrifices are being brought to the temple, and He's upset with the priest on their lifestyle and how their lifestyle is causing other people to stumble. Title lesson says we need just leaders, and we do. But today, all the preachers out there, the people, men and women of God, the ones who's positioned to influence people, no matter where you are, even, uh, ushers, the, the choir members, the teachers, and all that, we can cause people to stumble. And when we cause people to stumble, we are in big trouble. But we have to understand the responsibility that God has given us, given us one of, of obedience of uh, one of, of of making sure we can uh, uh, part the uh, parse the word right, teach it correctly. We have a tremendous amount of responsibility, and with this responsibility can come consequences if we don't live up to that. And God has laid it out of uh, how what He suspect of a priest, and how the priest in the in the time of Malachi. We're not living up to that. And God has to do something about it. He's a holy God. He's the Lord of hosts. He can no, He only can tolerate evil for so long. And these people here, they let the circumstances get the best of them. Instead of turning it, letting the circumstances turn them to God, it turned them away from God. And the day that we live in now, with all this chaos, with all this uncertainty, we have got to be drawn to God. And those in higher positions of teaching and influencing people. We got to make sure that we know the word of God and we are instructing our people correctly because we can cause them to stumble. And just because we live in a time of uncertainty right now doesn't mean that we don't give God our best. We always give our God our best in good times and bad times. We always praise him in good times and bad times. We always honor him in good times and bad times. We, we the, uh, the, the Bible says the righteous shall live by faith. That means no matter what happens to me, no matter what I, where I find myself, I will always remain faithful to God because the righteous, those who love the Lord, 
Those who are obedient live by faith. Let's go to uh, chapter three. Chapter three is a, the context is eschat, eschat, eschatology, meaning that it's the end times, meaning that um, if we're dealing with something that's going to happen in the future. So what, what Malachi is saying here is for a, a, a point in the future when Christ returns. So that's the end days. At the end days, Jesus comes with judgment. But sometimes what happens is that when we're living a wayward lifestyle, when we're doing what we want to do, we get confused and think because God hasn't struck us down that God must like us or we must be doing something right. Or if he doesn't care, we think that God on the last day will just welcome us in since we are his covenant people and since he hasn't struck us down. But God is saying here, this is not going to happen. You're going to be, if you're a priest, especially, everybody, but really a priest, you're going to be held accountable. Your judgment is going to be severe because of the responsibility that was given you. So he says here, behold, I will send a messenger, my messenger, not talking about Malachi. He's talking about a, a forerunner. In this case, it will probably be Elijah that will prepare the way before me. Elijah, many scholars believe he will be the one that will prepare the way for the second coming or the advent of Jesus Christ. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to this temple. Remember, the Jewish people are seeking uh, the coming of Jesus Christ. Ever since uh, sin came in there, God promised that he will send a redeemer. And so they have been waiting for this redeemer. So the one you seek will suddenly come to this temple. Even though there will be a forerunner, when he comes, he will come suddenly. You will not be able to predict it. You will not know, but he will come suddenly in a flash to his temple, to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord. Oh, God says this, 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 Jesus is coming. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? Okay, so when he comes, people will be under judgment. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? That means no one. For he's like a refiner's fire, like a full of soap. He will sit at a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. He will come and he will see who is real and who is not. He will, the, the priest at that time will be like gold and silver. The priest that he raises up will have been refined and they will represent him. And they will be able to bring offerings in righteousness to, God, to the Lord. The priest at the second coming of Jesus will be righteous and holy. They will have been refined and their offerings will be worthy unto the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. Now he's talking to the priests of this day. Then I will draw you near for judgment. Those who did not worship me correctly, those who offered me uh, blemished and weak and poor sacrifices, those whose attitude was not right, those who did not honor me, those who did not fear me. It says, I will draw near to you for judgment. It will not be a time of blessing for you. It will be a time of judgment. You will think you're going to get blessed, but you will be under judgment. You will think I'm getting blessed because God hasn't done anything. God doesn't care about me. What difference does it make? But no, God does care. And that's the, the fallacy that you make. God loves you enough to care. Just God says, I will be a swift witness. I've seen everything that you've done. I've seen what's in your heart. I will lay out my case. I will be the, the prosecutor. I will be the judge. And I will be the jury. And I will be the witness on the stand against sorcerers, some of which you are, against adulterers, some of which you are, against those who swear falsely, who lie. I will be a witness against those, against those who oppress hired workers in his wages, those who made a deal to pay somebody a certain amount, but we reneged on it, either paid them less than or didn't pay them anything. I see what's going on. It's not getting by. If you're mistreating people, I see it. If you have an affair on your wife and you think you're getting away with it, I know it too. If you're looking at your horoscope and believing in the horoscope, then I see that also. If you're telling lies, I see that too. You're not getting away with it. On judgment day, 
I will be a witness against you because I see everything that you do. I see everything. I see those who mistreat the widow, the orphan, and those who kick aside the sojourner. And he lumps these people at the end of verse five as those who do not fear me. Those are the type of people who do what they want to do as if there's no God. That reminds me of Luke 18 about the unjust judge who was arrogant and boastful, lived his life as if there was no God, just mistreating people, just doing all of what he wants to do. And what God says here, the Lord of hosts, the almighty God, that you will not get away with it. He says, for I am a Lord that does not change. Meaning that I have always loved you, but who I am, my statutes and my principles do not change. He says, but that, that works out good for you. Because although many of you may be consumed, there will be a remnant that will not be consumed, that will go on and, will, and, and, and represent my, uh, the Jewish people as my children. He says, therefore, O you, children of Jacob, are not consumed, okay? He's not going to do to you like he did the northern tribes. There will be a remnant there. He says, from the days of your father, you have turned aside from my statutes. And you have not kept them. He says, I plead to you now, so this judgment day won't be what it has to be. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. What does God want? He wants a relationship with you and me. What does God want? He wants a relationship of life and peace with me and you. He wants you to prosper. He wants harmony in the relationship. He wants true worship. He wants your heart to be right. He doesn't want you to go through the motions and faking it. He wants you to treat your neighbor right. We live in a time right now with the coronavirus again. Many people have lost their job. Some people are going to lose everything. And it's unfortunate. The shutdowns, millions upon millions of people are going to face hardship. What does he want for them? He wants them to remain faithful to him. God is telling them, I have never stopped loving you. I do not change. I, I don't change. That means I'm, 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 I've always known everything. I know what you're going through. I know what's in your heart. I know what you're thinking about. Keep on trusting me. Keep on being faithful. Keep our relationship intact. I will get you through it. You may not know how, you may not know when, but you have my promise. I will redeem you. Those 90% who, who have not lost their job, what is God saying to us through this, this time of uncertainty, this time of mass layoffs and near depression and many people will be living in poverty and many people have lost all their money or most of their money. If you are working and if you are able to, Help out those who have lost their job. Buy them some food. Uh, put gas in their cars. Uh, uh, help them with a utility bill, a water bill, gas bill. Uh, help, give them something toward their mortgage. Help them out in a certain way. Be an encouragement to them. God wants to use you to speak to them, to tell them how great he is, to tell them that he cares to tell them that he loves them. God has given you a responsibility, an even greater responsibility to do what is right in these difficult times. So all I wanna say is this, God is speaking to us. This is a timely lesson. Worship God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Give God your very best. Constantly do a self checkup. Make sure your heart is right. Make uh, Give God your entire being, not just this here, this piece here, this piece here, and leave this area untouched. This area untouched can grow big and he consume these. Grow in the Lord. Be for real. God will give you life and peace. God will get you through anything that you're going through, sickness, illness, poverty, out of a job. God will get you through it. God will pay your bills. Just stay with him. Do not forsake him. And in the way you want to know if you're with God and you're treating God right, look at your worship. Look at what you give to him. Look at your sacrifice. That would be a great indicator 
for where you stand with God. May God bless you. I love you much. I will see you next week. Have a great Sunday.